Chapter Five of Arthur Mervyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Arthur Mervyn by Charles Brockton Brown. Chapter Five. Now I was once more on public ground. By so many anxious efforts had I disengaged myself from the perilous precincts of private property. As many stratagems as are usually made to enter a house had been employed by me to get out of it. I was urged to the use of them by my fears, yet so far from carrying off spoil I had escaped with the loss of an essential part of my dress. I had now leisure to reflect. I seated myself on the ground and reviewed the scenes through which I had just passed. I began to think that my industry had been misemployed. Suppose I had met the person on his first entrance into his chamber. Was the truth so utterly wild as to not have found credit? Since the door was locked and there was no other avenue, what other statement but the true one would account for my being found there? This deportment had been worthy of an honest purpose. My betrayer probably expected that this would be the issue of his jest. My rustic simplicity, he might think, would suggest no more ambiguous or elaborate expedient. He might likewise have predetermined to interfere if my safety had been really endangered. On the morrow, the two doors of the chamber and the window below would be found unclosed. They will suspect a design to pillage, but their searches will terminate in nothing but in the discovery of a pair of clumsy and dusty shoes in the closet. Now that I was safe, I could not help smiling at the picture. Which my fancy drew of their anxiety and wonder. These thoughts, however, gave place to more momentous considerations. I could not imagine to myself a more perfect example of indigence than I now exhibited. There was no being in the city on whose kindness I had any claim. Money I had none, and what I then wore comprised my whole stock of movables. I had just lost my shoes, and this loss rendered my stockings of no use. My dignity remonstrated against a barefoot pilgrimage, but to this necessity now reconciled me. I threw my stockings between the bars of a stable window, belonging as I thought to the mansion I had just left. These, together with my shoes, I left to pay the cost of my entertainment. I saw that the city was no place for me. The end that I had had in view of procuring some mechanical employment could only be obtained by the use of means, but what means to pursue I knew not. This night's perils and deceptions gave me a distaste to a city life, and my ancient occupations rose to my view, enhanced by a thousand imaginary charms. I resolved forthwith to strike into the country. The day began now to dawn. It was Sunday, and I was desirous of eluding observation. I was somewhat recruited by rest, though the languors of sleeplessness oppressed me. I meant to throw myself on the first lap of verdure I should meet, and indulge in sleep that I so much wanted. I knew not the direction of the streets, but followed that which I first entered from the court, trusting that by adhering steadily to one course, I should some time reach the fields. This street, as I afterwards found, tended to Schoolkill, and soon extricated me from houses. I could not cross this river without payment of toll. It was requisite to cross it in order to reach that part of the country whither I was desirous of going, but how should I effect my passage? I knew of no ford, and the smallest expense exceeded my capacity. Ten thousand guineas and a farthing were equally remote from nothing, and nothing was the portion allotted to me. While my mind was thus occupied, I turned up one of the streets which tend northward. It was for some length uninhabited and unpaved. Presently I reached a pavement and a painted fence along which a row of poplars was planted. It bounded a garden into which a knot hole permitted me to pry. The enclosure was a charming green, which I saw appended to a house of the loftiest and most stately order. 
It seemed like a recent erection, and had all the gloss of novelty, and exhibited to my unpractised eyes the magnificence of palaces. My father's dwelling did not equal the height of one story, and might be easily comprised in one-fourth of those buildings which were here designed to accommodate the menials. My heart dictated the comparison between my own condition and that of the proprietors of this domain. How wide and how impassable was the gulf by which we were separated! This fair inheritance had fallen to one who, perhaps, would only abuse it to the purposes of luxury, while I, with intentions worthy of the friend of mankind, was doomed to wield the flail and the mattock. I had been entirely unaccustomed to this strain of reflection. My books had taught me the dignity and safety of the middle path, and my darling writer abounded with encomiums on rural life. At a distance from luxury and pomp I viewed them perhaps in a just light. A nearer scrutiny confirmed my early prepossessions, but, at the distance at which I now stood, the lofty edifices, the splendid furniture, and the copious accommodations of the rich excited my admiration and my envy. I relinquished my station and proceeded, in a heartless mood, along the fence. I now came to the mansion itself. The principal door was entered by a staircase of marble. I had never seen the stone of Carrara, and wildly supposed this to have been dug from Italian quarries. The beauty of the poplars, the coolness exhaled from the dew besprent bricks, the commodiousness of the seat which these steps afforded, and the uncertainty into which I was plunged respecting my future conduct, all combined to make me pause. I sat down on the lower step and began to meditate. By some transition it occurred to me that the supply of my most urgent wants might be found in some inhabitant of this house. I needed at present a few cents, and what were a few cents to the tenant of a mansion like this? I had an invincible aversion to the calling of a beggar, but I regarded with still more antipathy the vocation of a thief. To this alternative, however, I was now reduced. I must either steal or beg, unless indeed assistance could be procured under the notion of a loan. Would a stranger refuse to lend the pittance that I wanted? Surely not, when the urgency of my wants was explained. I recollected other obstacles. To summon the master of the house from his bed, perhaps for the sake of such an application, would be preposterous. I should be in more danger of provoking his anger than exciting his benevolence. This request might, surely, with more propriety be preferred to a passenger. I should probably meet several before I should arrive at Schoolkill. A servant just then appeared at the door with a bucket and brush. This obliged me much sooner than I intended to decamp. With some reluctance I rose and proceeded. This house occupied the corner of the street, and I now turned this corner towards the country. A person at some distance before me was approaching in an opposite direction. Why, said I, may I not make my demand of the first man I meet? This person exhibits tokens of ability to lend. There is nothing chilling or austere in his demeanor. The resolution to address this passenger was almost formed, but the nearer he advanced my resolves grew less firm. He noticed me not till he came within a few paces. He seemed busy in reflection, and had not my figure caught his eye, or had he merely bestowed a passing glance upon me, I should not have been sufficiently courageous to have detained him. The event, however, was widely different. He looked at me and started. For an instant, as it were, until he had time to dart at me a second glance, he checked his pace. This behavior decided mine, and he stopped on perceiving tokens of a desire to address him. I spoke, but my accents and air sufficiently denoted my embarrassments. 
I am going to solicit a favor which my situation makes of the highest importance to me, and which I hope it will be easy for you, sir, to grant. It is not an alms, but a loan that I seek, a loan that I will repay the moment I am able to do it. I am going into the country, but have not wherewith to pay my passage over Schoolkill, or to buy a morsel of bread. May I venture to request of you, sir, the loan of sixpence? As I told you, it is my intention to repay it. I delivered this address not without some faltering, but with great earnestness. I laid particular stress upon my intention to refund the money. He listened with a most inquisitive air. His eyes perused me from head to foot. After some pause, he said in a very emphatic manner, Why into the country? Have you family, kindred, friends? No, answered I, I have neither. I go in search of the means of subsistence. I have passed my life upon a farm and propose to die in the same condition. Whence have you come? I came yesterday from the country with a view to earn my bread in some way, but have changed my plan and propose now to return. Why have you changed it? In what way are you capable of earning your bread? I hardly know, said I. I can as yet manage no tool that can be managed in the city but the pen. My habits have, in some small degree, qualified me for a writer. I would willingly accept employment of that kind. He fixed his eyes upon the earth and was silent for some minutes. At length, recovering himself, he said, Follow me to my house. Perhaps something may be done for you. If not, I will lend you sixpence. It may be supposed that I eagerly complied with the invitation. My companion said no more, his air bespeaking him to be absorbed by his own thoughts, till he reached his house, which proved to be that at the door of which I had been seated. We entered a parlor together. Unless you can assume my ignorance and my simplicity, you will be unable to conceive the impression that were made by the size and ornaments of this apartment. I shall omit these impressions, which indeed no description could adequately convey, and dwell on incidents of greater moment. He asked me to give him a specimen of my penmanship. I told you that I had bestowed very great attention upon this art. Implements were brought, and I sat down to the task. By some inexplicable connection a line in Shakespeare occurred to me, and I wrote, My poverty but not my will consents. The sentiment conveyed in this line powerfully affected him, but in a way which I could not then comprehend. I collected from subsequent events that the inference was not unfavorable to my understanding or my morals. He questioned me as to my history. I related my origin and my inducements to desert my father's house. With respect to last night's adventures, I was silent. I saw no useful purpose that could be answered by disclosure, and I half suspected that my companion would refuse to credit my tale. There were frequent intervals of abstraction and reflection between his questions. My examination lasted not much less than an hour. At length he said, I want an amanuensis or copyist. On what terms will you live with me? I answered that I knew not how to estimate the value of my services. I knew not whether these services were agreeable or healthful. My life had hitherto been active. My constitution was predisposed to diseases of the lungs, and the change might be hurtful. I was willing, however, to try and to content myself for a month or a year with so much as would furnish me with food, clothing, and lodging. "'Tis well,' said he. You remain with me as long and no longer than both of us please. You shall lodge and eat in this house. I will supply you with clothing, and your task will be to write what I dictate. Your person, I see, has not shared much of your attention. It is in my power to equip you instantly in the manner which becomes a resident in this house. Come with me. He led the way into the court behind and thence into a neat building, which contained large wooden vessels and a pump. There, said he, you may wash yourself, and when that is done I will conduct you to your chamber in your wardrobe. This was speedily performed, and he accordingly led the way to the chamber. 
It was an apartment in the third story, finished and furnished in the same costly and superb style with the rest of the house. He opened closets and drawers which overflowed with clothes and linen of all of the best kinds. "'These are yours,' said he, "'as long as you stay with me. Dress yourself as likes you best. Here is everything your nakedness requires. When dressed you may descend to breakfast.' With these words he left me. The clothes were all in the French style, as I afterwards, by comparing my garb with that of others, discovered. They were fitted to my shape with the nicest precision. I bedecked myself with all my care. I remembered the style of dress used by my beloved Clavering. My locks were of shining auburn, flowing and smooth like his. Having wrung the wet from them and combed, I tied them carelessly in a black ribbon. Thus equipped, I surveyed myself in a mirror. You may imagine, if you can, the sensations which this instantaneous transformation produced. Appearances are wonderfully influenced by dress. Check shirt buttoned at the neck, an awkward fustian coat, check trousers and bare feet, were now supplanted by linen and muslin, nankeen coats striped with green, a white silk waistcoat elegantly needle-wrought, cashmere pantaloons, stockings of variegated silk, and shoes that in their softness, pliancy, and polished surface vied with satin. I could scarcely forbear looking back to see whether the image in the glass, so well proportioned, so gallant, and so graceful, did not belong to another. I could scarcely recognize any lineaments of my own. I walked to the window. Twenty minutes ago, said I, I was traversing that path a barefoot beggar. Now I am thus. Again I surveyed myself. Surely some insanity is fastened on my understanding. My senses are the sport of dreams. Some magic that disdains the cumbrousness of nature's progress has wrought this change. I was roused from these doubts by a summons to breakfast, obsequiously delivered by a black servant. I found Welbeck, for I shall henceforth call him by his true name, at the breakfast table. A superb equipage of silver and china was before him. He was startled at my entrance. The change in my dress seemed for a moment to have deceived him. His eye was frequently fixed upon me with unusual steadfastness. At these times there was an inquietude and wonder in his features. I had now an opportunity of examining my host. There was nicety, but no ornament in his dress. His form was of the middle height, spare but vigorous and graceful. His face was cast, I thought, in a foreign mould. His forehead receded beyond the usual degree in visages which I had seen. His eyes large and prominent, but imparting no marks of benignity and habitual joy. The rest of his face forcibly suggested the idea of a convex edge. His whole figure impressed me with emotions of veneration and awe. A gravity that almost amounted to sadness invariably attended him when we were alone together. He whispered the servant that waited, who immediately retired. He then said, turning to me, A lady will enter presently, whom you are to treat with the respect due to my daughter. You must not notice any emotion she may betray at the sight of you, nor expect her to converse with you, for she does not understand your language. He had scarcely spoken when she entered. I was seized with certain misgivings and flutterings which a clownish education may account for. I so far conquered my timidity, however, to snatch a look at her. I was not born to execute her portrait. Perhaps the turban that wreathed her head, the brilliant texture and inimitable folds of her drapery and nymph-like port, more than the essential attributes of her person, gave splendor to the celestial vision. Perhaps it was her snowy hues and the cast rather than the position of her features that were so prolific of enchantment, or perhaps the wonder originated only in my own ignorance. She did not immediately notice me. 
When she did, she almost shrieked with surprise. She held up her hands, and, gazing upon me, uttered various exclamations which I could not understand. I could only remark that her accents were thrillingly musical. Her perturbations refused to be stilled. It was with difficulty that she withdrew her regards from me. Much conversation passed between her and Welbeck, but I could comprehend no part of it. I was at liberty to animadvert on the visible part of their intercourse. I diverted some part of my attention from my own embarrassments and fixed it on their looks. In this art, as in most others, I was an unpractised simpleton. In the countenance of Welbeck there was somewhat else than sympathy with the astonishment and distress of the lady, but I could not interpret these additional tokens. When her attention was engrossed by Welbeck, her eyes were frequently vagrant or downcast, her cheeks contracted a deeper hue, and her breathing was almost prolonged into a sigh. These were marks on which I made no comments at the time. My own situation was calculated to breed confusion in my thoughts and awkwardness in my gestures. Breakfast being finished, the lady, apparently at the request of Welbeck, sat down to a pianoforte. Here again I must be silent. I was not wholly destitute of musical practice and musical taste. I had that degree of knowledge which enabled me to estimate the transcendent skill of this performer. As if the pathos of her touch were insufficient, I found after some time that the lawless jarrings of the keys were chastened by her own more liquid notes. She played without a book, and though her bass might be preconcerted, it was plain that her right-hand notes were momentary and spontaneous inspirations. Meanwhile Welbeck stood, leaning his arms on the back of the chair near her, with his eyes fixed on her face. His features were fraught with a meaning which I was eager to interpret, but unable. I have read of transitions affected by magic. I have read of palaces and deserts which were subject to the dominion of spells. Poets may sport with their power, but I am certain that no transition was ever conceived more marvelous and more beyond the reach of foresight than that which I had just experienced. Heaths vexed by a midnight storm may be changed into a hall of coral nymphs and regal banqueting. Forest glades may give sudden place to colonnades and carnivals, but he whose senses are deluded finds himself still on his natal earth. These miracles are contemptible when compared with that which placed me under this roof and gave me to partake in this audience. I know that my emotions are in danger of being regarded as ludicrous by those who cannot figure to themselves the consequences of a limited and rustic education. End of chapter 5